Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to give a few seconds for all of the attendees to filter into the room. It looks like their numbers are going up for another minute or two. Fantastic, let's start. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tuesday Ray Tano. I'm the Deputy Director of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. And I'm delighted to be moderating this event today um, in the margins of the CND. Um, this event is focused around a conversation on multilateral drug control. We are focusing the substantive presentation on a book by my colleague, GI's Director of Academic Research, Dr. John Collins, called Legalizing the Drug Wars. As many of you know, I'm sure, the Global Initiative is a civil society organization headquartered in Geneva and in Vienna that is committed to strengthening the global response to transnational organized crime and mitigating its impact on those who are most vulnerable. A key part of our mandate is to pro promote cross-disciplinary debate, to try and have a wide selection of views and to exchange them in a frank and open space informed by a strong evidence basis. For us, this meeting today is a key part of that mandate's achievement and on a very important topic. I'm not going to take much time since as always side events are short, but I would like to offer my thanks to our co-organizers for this event, um, the World Society for Victimology. And at this juncture, I'd like to invite the co-host, Dr. Robert Peacock, to give some opening remarks. Dr. Peacock is the academic head of the Department of Criminology and his full-time job at the University of the Free State, South Africa. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, the World Society is first and foremost very honored to participate in this important event of today, uh, together with the permanent mission of Mexico and the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. So as we are all aware, criminal groups have wasted no time in embracing today's globalized economy and the sophisticated technology and modus operandi that go with it. Now, to address this scourge of drugs as this global problem, and with reference to the critical work of Dr. John Collins presented here today, the regulatory core should indeed coexist with the broad shift towards the sustainable development um, goals of the UN, with the greater emphasis on harm reduction and increasing regulatory experimentation and participation at local level. Moreover, in recalling the Declaration of Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime and Abuse of Power, for us to remain mindful and always to be sensitive to the needs of victims of crime and abuse of power, also with reference to the so-called victimless and or indirect victims of drug, drugs, drug-related crimes and drug wars, based on the very conviction that all victims are equal, and that regulatory and other measures to support and assist must ensure non-discrimination consistent with international law, including international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and international refugee law. Not only for marginalized victim groups, but victim rights in general remain a global challenge and therefore needs to be understood as universal rights and not to be rendered as mere paper dragons, when the understanding of context is more often than not relegated in our aspirations to advance successful regulatory responses and the implementation thereof in dealing with societal ills. <clears throat> Excuse me. With context, one can refer, of course, to the historical, cultural, socioeconomic, and geopolitical contexts, but also with due recognition to the very root causes of crime and victimization in our regulatory environment. Considerable work has been done with reference to the sustainable development goals, and in particular to the value of proactive crime and victimization prevention strategies, but also with a demonstration of the risks of proactive policing strategies that are used disproportionately to target ethnic minorities and indigenous communities thereby undermining the legitimacy of the police and the criminal justice system and the, therefore also the rule of law in general. At the 2020 Nelson Mandela lecture, 
the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres referred to inequality as an issue that defines our time, that risks destroying the world's economies and societies with consequences to all worldwide. It remains, however, often too easy for policymakers to lean into the existing and dangerous biases of so-called strong communities, instead of looking for structural and systemic solutions together with regulatory responses. Although as also important and laudable, the concept of resilience or the ability to bounce back uh, terminology appropriated appropriate from the field of engineering has become a catchword in international development and has not been added to all kinds of reports and policies. In other words, in some instances, we may not be always able to fix it. We may not be able to stop it, but continuously we're asking entire communities to be resilient in the face of food and housing shortages gangsterism, police violence, land theft, state corporate crime, public health biases, and employment um, security. And this can conceal structural and institutional victimization, including ongoing state-sanctioned violence against disenfranchised individuals and communities. The futilities of transgenerational structural and institutional victimization may therefore remain concealed and unabated, thereby undermining also the successful implementation of legal instruments and frameworks, but within a framework of localizing and multilateralism, local, national, international, and regional role players should be viewed as the co-owners of crime victims' concerns in order to advance an emancipatory agenda of a people's oriented victimological discourse by leaving no one behind. I would like to refer to the African Ubuntu humanist values of Nelson Mandela and Emeritus Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the capacity of the African culture in particular to express compassion, reciprocity, dignity, harmony and humanity in the interest of building and maintaining communities characterized by justice and mutual caring. Our sense of humanity is inextricably linked and bound up in the sharing of a greater whole. But this is also dis dis um, diminished when others are oppressed, tortured or treated as if they were less than we are. As crime and victimization seek to dehumanize, it is useful to apply a cultural lens to view the manner in which individuals and groups perceive themselves and their responsibilities in relation to others. An ongoing reflection and reappraisal of the principles of communality, reciprocity and inclusivity of Ubuntu, which are also apparent in diverse forms in other cultures and traditions. Um, this could serve to re-emphasize the essential unity of all of humankind and to promote values that are based on the sharing of resources, as well as collaborative initiatives for addressing issues related to victims of crime and abuse of power, as we are doing here today. Or in the words of Dr. John Collins, to rise to the challenge, to navigate coherence and flexibility at the international levels. Um, our very best wishes as the world society of victimology with all further deliberations today um, as well as in the imminent future. Thank you, um, distinguished guests and participants. Robert, thank you so much and well done for finding such a great quote in John's book to pass us over to his presentation. And of course, John, congratulations on writing such a great quote in the first place. I'm very pleased now to give the floor to Dr. John Collins, who is the author of the book that we're featuring our discussion around. It's called Legalizing the Drug Wars. John is a, the Director of Academic Engagement with us at the GI. He's the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Illicit Economies and Development, which we co-author with the London School of Economics. He is the Treasurer and Secretary, for his sins clearly, of the International Society for the Study of Drug Policy and a Fellow at the Centre of Criminology at the University of Hong Kong. John, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, well, I assume everyone can hear me, but 
Well, firstly, just to say thank you, Tuesday, and thank you, Robert. I think, Robert, your remarks were um, extremely eloquent, eloquent and extremely on the mark, I think, in, in highlighting the contemporary policy issues for this topic, and I think has given a really nice um, overview of where the policy terrain is. And for me to kind of delve back, I think, into the history a little bit. So thank you very much. That was, it was really interesting to listen to. Um, just before I start, um, to say thank you to the Embassy of Mexico. I've, I've been involved in CND for, for many years now, always showing leadership on this topic and always willing to, to host events. So very, very much appreciated. Um, and just quickly, thank you to Cambridge University Press also for their support of the event. Um, also, I'd be remiss if I didn't thank my colleagues, particularly Ian Tennant and, and Claudio and Anna at GI um, for their leadership and support on this event. And then also just thank you to the very illustrious group of speakers. Um, I am honoured that this is actually the first launch of the book that I've done. Um, and I think CND is a very, a, a very fitting uh, environment for it. And I'm, I'm very humbled by that. Um, and I hope it is some useful tool for those who, who are working in the system and, and who, instead of being an outside observer, are actually working as part of the system, system's continued development. So with that said, I will try to get my slides to work. I presume everyone can see that. Yep. OK, so the book has two focuses, effectively. Um, the first is to answer the, quest, the historical question, right? Where does the international legal framework for drug control come from? Um, what state interests informed its development? What were the complex diplomatic processes that underpinned it, right? And, and part of the reason for this is we have these narratives about the system and we have these understandings of the system, which aren't always grounded in historical reality. So I think to, to really, as we look at ways forward in the system, I think it is very important to look backwards and see what was the logic underpinning it? What did states actually believe they were signing up for? What were the purpose of intents of the treaties and, and, and the broader uh, regulatory framework around the system. And then a second element of the book is an attempt to layer an international relations uh, theoretical framework on top of the historical approach. So to say, this is where we are in the system uh, and, and this is potential routes we can go. And, and ultimately that international relations framework is underpinned by a historiography or historiographical approach. Understanding history, to understand the present, to, to have thoughts about where we're going in the future. We also, there is a couple of sub questions I've just highlighted here and I, there are topics I will touch on in my presentation. I obviously can't give a, a history of the UN drug control system in 15 minutes. So I've, I've tried to give as much of a, a, a general discussion as possible just to make it relevant. But these questions of where did the quote war on drugs come from? And um, was it, um, and I, I really am not, if I mention member states today, this is not to pick on member states. It is purely that I'm trying to tell some of the story. Um, I'm trying to tell some of the story. And so I have to reference some, remember, some member states. So I will mention states like the US and the UK, just because they're a pretty significant part of that historical story. But, but was the UN drug control system a US creation? Uh, do the conventions mandate a quote, war on drugs? Are they a quote, straight jacket that, that limit member states behavior ultimately? And as Robert alluded to, I think this is something that I'm particularly focused on in my research is this idea of the core regulatory elements of the system versus uh, the peripheral aspects of the system. So I'm going to be hopefully dispelling some myths, right? Firstly, I, have, I cannot say how many times I've heard over the last 15 years that the US created the UN drug control system, they created the single convention. That is a factually inaccurate st statement to make. The US did not create the system. It was not simply a US construct. As I'm gonna highlight, the US actually didn't support the single convention initially. It was a multilateral construct. Member states from around the world negotiated these sets of treaties that we rely on today. They have buy-in to those treaties. They had agency in the creation of those treaties. And that is, I think, a very important narrative to get right as we think of the way forward. Um, they were not simply forced and unwilling and unaware member states. Again, this, this point of agency, governments knew in most cases what they were signing up to. They had an activist active role in, in negotiating them. Um, this point of them being a neo-colonial construct, I say this purely, I, I, I completely sympathize and understand this, this, um, this attempt to you know, decolonize literature and decolonize our understandings of institutions, but we have to also be historically accurate with this, I think. Um, these, these were not a neo-colonial uh, construct, except in the sense that all UN law is a neo-colonial construct, right? They derive in some way from the, the power relations of colonial powers into the 20th century. Um, international opium control and, and regulation in the 20th century was fundamentally, in a historical sense, uh, seen as an anti-colonial endeavor, right? States who were advocating the creation of the UN drug control system, or, or the first of the League of Nations drug control system, saw it as a means towards anti-colonialism. 
So when one of the first histories we have of the League of Nations system, a very excellent history by a, an African-American scholar called Arnold Taylor, he wrote it back in the 1960s, he named the book A, Type, a Study in Humanitarian uh, uh, Reform. Right. So that gives an indication of what states thought they were doing at the time and also what outside observers thought they were doing at the time. And then a final point on this, um, post-colonial states were the most um, uh, vigorous and interested adherents to the system. And this goes all the way back actually to pre-systemic. I've written about Egypt in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, states that were becoming newly independent or developing newly independent structures were very keen on drug control. And one of the reasons was it was seen as a remnant from, for colonial rule. And again, this is not to take a value judgment on any of these points. It is, I think it is to highlight why we have governments throughout the world who really adhere very, very um, strictly and, and interestedly to the system. And then the final myth, the system enforces prohibition of member states, it's slightly more controversial to topic, I guess, but, but I would certainly be of the view as, as in, from a historical perspective, I, I have never come across evidence that member states uh, particularly around the single convention, thought they were signing up to, quote, prohibition and that they would have to enforce prohibition at all costs in their countries. There's just no sense of that. In fact, you find lots of evidence to the contrary, that they felt that effectively it was it was uh, codifying what was already practiced in most member states um, and, and that ultimately the system was, was uh, the negotiations had softened out the system to a point where they weren't, they didn't feel like it was imposing severe obligations on them. So if we just take the beginning, right, if we go back to the beginning, uh, multilateral drug control originated at the turn of the 20th century. And the aim was not to prohibit drugs in all points in all parts of the world at all times. The point was to manage the spillovers associated with the production, the manufacture, and the trade and consumption of certain substances globally. You have this, end of, you have this globalization process where these substances are much cheaper, much easier to produce, much easier to ship around the world in large quantities. And governments felt there was there was probably some merit to trying to regulate this trade, the same way as we regulate lots of lots of trades and lots of um, systems around the world. So part of the original uh, um, intent of the system was as a limit on predatory state behavior, right? To to enable governments to be able to adhere to their own regulations uh, through putting some kind of global uniformity. So as an example, if one country wanted to prohibit um, uh, certain types of drug consumption, which many of them did, um, then uh, the system, they couldn't do that if another country basically had no, no controls. If another country, you could basically produce the drugs, ship it into the country that had prohibited it, um, have it smuggled in, and you make a profit off it. That's ultimately what the origins of the system were, to prevent that kind of behavior by states and, and to create a set of uniform obligations. Um, while certain states held, held this kind of um, uh, uh, expansionist vision of controls, right? At what I define the war on drugs as is an absolute and symmetrical implementation of prohibitions. And some states did have that vision. I, I think it's fair to argue the US probably most of them had that vision, right? It was from their experience in the Philippines in the early 1900s. If everyone just prohibits, then, then the problem goes away. Um, but it was, it was, that was not the predominant view within the system, certainly among, I think, European states. Um, it, it, the system was for them a means to enable national regulations to coexist and with an ultimate goal of limiting the trade and use in what they called dangerous drugs. Um, on, the, on this normative vision, we have to understand there was very limited dissent throughout. Um, even today, the, you know, I, I think there is dissent on uh, strategic approaches and certainly on tactical approaches. But the idea of an international system to limit what we call the world drug problem, but we could define in any number of ways, there is this consensus, I think, that at least that is, that is a goal that states aim towards. And then the final point, forward progress in the system has always depended on consensus. And that is something that's very important for our contemporary discussions. As we, as we talk about the breakdown in consensus and the fragmentation of the system, we have to understand this is not the first time that this has occurred. This, there has been repeated periods of what we'd call the dissensus within the system, absolute complete breakdown, in fact. And it was not simply one state dictating the way forward at any time. That never worked. I can't think of an example over the last century where one state was able to basically bludgeon other states into following its approach. In fact, it failed a good number of times. So if we take the example of the US, I'm sorry again to pick on the US, but it's just the usual, um, it's, it's the one that gets spoken about most. The US walked out of negotiations over the 1925 convention. They never signed it. They stopped interacting with the system for roughly five years. 
they, they withdrew their participation from the 1936 convention, which meant that it never really went into force. The US effectively ignored the single convention and spent their time trying to bring the 1953 protocol into force. And to just give you a sense of sentiment within the US about this uh, 61 convention, this is a powerful senator who would have been responsible for ratifying it, saying that they wouldn't. The US Senate would not pass the single convention. Far from strengthening international controls, it would become a means of flooding countries with large amounts of addictive drugs. Right? So the US ultimately failed in their endeavor, and then, then they refused to ratify the single convention until 1967. So that just gives you a sense of when we talk about now being a unique period of dissensus and the, the system has never experienced it, that's not correct, right? We've had many of these in the past and the system goes in, goes in peaks and troughs like, like most other regulatory regimes. How did the single convention gain hegemony? Well, uh, it, it was pretty clear that when novice states, governments that weren't innately involved in, in, in the drug issue, when they arrived at the plenipotentiary conference for the single convention, they were actually quite astounded at some of the tensions and how governments were basically ripping up earlier drafts and trying to rewrite it. What ultimately happened is that strict control advocates, states pushing a, a very tough line on the single convention, um, they, they were largely disconnected for various reasons, which I talk about. They were strategically outmaneuvered um, and they were unable to drive the process. And so uh, I, I, not, not to be too nice to the UK or hard to say, this is again, not to put a value judgment on it, but the UK were leading what we could consider a moderate group of states, which was actually the majority of states. They wanted a more flexible agreement. They didn't want to jeopardize certain national interests. For example, I'll give you the UK example. Um, we, we don't want to raise prescription drug costs because the NHS is a national entity. So every 5% increase in prescription drug costs costs us a lot of money. It costs the nas national exchequer a lot of money. We don't want to see that, right? That you extract those interests across the, the world with every country having their own idiosyncratic interests that they were trying to, to preserve. That's where you end up with this kind of moderate state goals. Uh, consolidate the past treaties, give them greater coherence, um, and, and maintain regulatory fle flexibility. So this is what, again, the UK delegate said of the 61 Convention. More, more controversial elements have basically been watered down into generally acceptable form. Hardly a declaration of the war on drugs, right? <laughs> Hardly a sense that, you know, we've, we've embarked on a revolutionary new system that is going to enforce, uh, is going to put all of these obligations on member states. So, as time went on, the system inevitably became more varied and complex. Um, there's a very famous book called The Gentleman's Club. It's an early history of the system. Um, it's, it, it's, it's a rather limited one, but it's, a, it's an interesting one. And it's an important early, early book on this. Um, and, and, and that's effectively, they were right. It, it was a gentleman's club early on, right? It was a couple of key member states uh, and key, key bureaucrats within those member states were, uh, were doing a lot of the negotiating lifting, but they weren't all on the same page. They had very different approaches and interests. But as time went on, it just became more complex. Member states couldn't retain control of it. Arguably, I think that's why the US didn't want to support the single convention as this reality was becoming apparent. The institutions had their own interests, states had their own interests, bureaucrats had their own interests, etc. So I like to think of it as kind of this armada of ships driving the super tanker. If we think of the super tanker as the core regulatory elements, the core institutional elements of the system, you have all of these smaller boats and smaller interests basically steering it in a very complex way. You can't quite determine how and why it shifts in certain directions. It's just when all of the boats suddenly start moving in a direction, it kind of goes, it goes in that direction as well. And there's two core logics, which I think underpin most negotiations and most changes in the system. Protect the regulatory core, which again, we see, we saw around on gas in 2016 and pr protect member state prerogatives. I think that's where the flexibilities came in around on gas, right? You protect member states abilities to diverge from the system. Um, and this leads to what, what I like to think of as a kind of functionalist model for change. The system tends to evolve towards the most useful tool for the most member states, right? So that, that it, will it has in the past and it will continue to do that. Um, and, 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 and then the point that member states' interests drive the system, not vice versa. I think our analysis has got that wrong over the last three to four decades. We reverse engineer the war on drugs from the international system. And I think the system has been more a facilitator and certainly an enabler of that in many ways, but it hasn't been the driver of that. So then we have the question of what comes next. And this brings us to this kind of international relations analysis. Um, and Tuesday, I hope I'm not going over time. Please jump in if I'm, if I'm running a bit long. Um, but we have, we have a, a effectively, uh, over the past 10 years, we have an effect, a division into two groups, what we'd call pluralists and integrationists. This is, I think, the main debate over the future of the system. 
Um, the integrationists tend to argue this idea of systemic coherence. The legal contours of the system are absolute, fixed, they're binding member states into a, a straight jacket of prohibition. And actually this group consists of, it then subdivides into both reformists, people who want to fundamentally change the system, and conservatives, people who want to change the system, keep the system exactly as it is. Um, uh, and and I, I've given an I, I, I argument about why I, I, I think I've alluded to my historical approach, which suggests, well, there wasn't absolute certainty on all elements within the system. Um, and actually, th that, that the, the historical accuracy of this approach, I would question. And then we have the second approach, which is the pluralist, which I would I put my hand up and say, I obviously subscribe to this view and the way I'm framing it obviously indicates that, um, but focuses on the idea of historical regulatory complexity. And from that comes uh, a, a, an argument of there's a pragmatic uh, utility to having less integration in the system, more flexibility in the immediate, immediate term as it evolves around new goals, uh, new norms, new strategies. And particularly as we develop evidence at local levels, so what Robert, I think, was talking about in the, introdu in the introduction, we develop evidence at local levels that will percolate up to the international level and, and thereby drive change. So the, the continuity, the continued utility for member states, firstly, dialogue is a public good. It's a mechanism to prevent disagreements becoming disputes. And so that's where member states have a, an, an interest in maintaining the system. I, I was very present from, I was around for the young gas discussions. And I think that was a pretty, that was a pretty strategic discussion about where the system can and should go. And I think universally almost, Member states did not want to break open the core elements of the system. They were willing to talk about what we call, again, the peripheral aspects and to find ways to, to, to soften those and to take the edges off those. But the idea of breaking, that, breaking the system and trying to rebuild it didn't have any major, um, I, I think, um, subscription among member states. That was certainly my, my perception of events. Um, and so this willingness to use legal and diplomatic ambiguity to avoid conflict on the more peripheral elements, cannabis legalization and also division over national strategies, that's obviously occurring, right? We see formal side events at the CND this year around cannabis legalization. It is becoming part of the system's discussion. It is still a, it is still a tension within the system, but ultimately I believe it will find a way to work it out. And then obviously that the regulatory core can coexist, as Robert highlighted, can coexist with broad shifts towards the SDGs, uh, focusing on reducing harms, harm reduction, uh, increasing regulatory experimentation. So I will wrap up by just saying um, the system, which, which formally began in 1909, frankly earlier, it survived two world wars. It fully operated, well, in theory, it fully operated during World War II. It hid out in Washington, DC, and actually the system of estimates continued. It survived the Cold War, the fall of the Soviet empire, the rise of multipolarity. It will likely continue to evolve today as it has in the past. And whether it becomes an effective, uh, an effective tool for better managing drug issues in the 21st century, that, de that, that depends ultimately, I think, on the outcome of policy reforms at national levels. Um, and also this ability to navigate, as Robert said, coherence and flexibility at the international levels. So that's my, my presentation and, and thank you everyone for attending the event. Thank you so much, John, and thank you for trying to encapsulate so many rich and interesting points, but also excellent case studies from your book into such a short presentation. We do, of course, encourage you all who are interested in the topic to pick up a copy. Um, we have next a pre-recorded video statement from the ambassador of one of the protagonist countries, which John mentioned both in his presentation and the book, the United Kingdom, which will focus on the UK's role in this history and their ambitions for the future. So I'm pleased to offer the virtual floor to Ambassador Lindsay Skoll, who is the UK ambassador to Austria and the UK permanent representative to the UN in Vienna. This year's Commission on Narcotic Drugs takes place in challenging and tragic geopolitical circumstances. Please let me take this opportunity to express my solidarity with the people of Ukraine at this terrible time. When we come together as the Commission each year, we do so to think about how we can better shape the future of UN drug policy. And as in all walks of life, it's important to understand how we got here, or as Churchill put it, the further back you can look, the further forward you're likely to see. I'm therefore delighted to join this event and to hear all about the history of this Commission, 
Through his excellent historical study about UN drug policy, published by Cambridge University Press. I'd be remiss if I didn't start by thanking all of the organisers. The World Society of Victimology, the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime and the Permanent Mission of Mexico for bringing all of us together for this event. Thank you. There's a lot of negative rhetoric about drugs. We can sometimes come to believe the rhetoric that we hear. It's all about war, combating or fighting. But actually I've been impressed to see that the history of UN drugs policy is all about the countries of the world coming together to discuss how we can support each other and agree a single set of rules. It's a remarkable achievement that we come together every year and make consensus-based agreements here at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs and that we agree and make concrete decisions about which substances member states believe should be brought under control to protect the public. It shows how the UN is an indispensable convener, that it is unique in allowing us to come together and to discuss these important issues, even against the background of tragic or difficult events. And at these times especially, it's even more important to do so. I hope that all member states at the Commission will continue to work in this spirit, that we continue to bolster the rules-based international order together. Indeed, this is exactly what is so excellently described in this book. Turning to the work of Dr Collins, which he has presented today, I'm sure you will all agree that it gives a rare insight into the complex and sometimes nuanced history of the UN Drug Control and Commission on Narcotic Drugs. The UK is really proud to be a member of the Commission, having been so for the vast majority of its history. No mean feat given it was born in the aftermath of World War II. Indeed, I'm proud to say that Dr Collins's book shows that the UK played an influential role in global drug policy and has done so throughout its history. We fully intend to continue in that role. In December 21, the UK launched its 10-year drugs plan, stating the ambition, our mission is to be at the forefront of international cooperation, working with our international partners to shape the global debate on drugs, respond to new threats and share evidence and best practice through our global networks. An essential part of this mission is sharing perspectives from different regions, member states, from civil society, victims, experts and academics. It's important to do this so we may better understand each other and better understand where we can work together to make a difference. That's the lesson I took from this excellent book and I hope you all get a chance to read it. Looking back, look forward together, sharing and learning from each other and most importantly, working together on global threats. I'm glad to be reminded of what lies at the core of the UN and proud that the UK has been a significant part of that tradition. Thank you once again, and although I can't be there in person, I wish you all, and know you will all have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much to Ambassador Skoll. Next, we're delighted to have with us Mr. Umesh Bhatia, who is the Singapore's permanent representative of the United Nations Office in Geneva since 2019, and concurrently accredited as Singapore's permanent representative to the UN office in Vienna. Mr. Bhatia joined the Foreign Service of Singapore in 1996 and has served in various capacities on issues covering Southeast Asia, Middle East, and the UN in the ministry's headquarters. Mr. Ambassador, would you please tell us why the UN drug control system and its history is significant for Singapore? And what exchange, uh, what changes you expect for the future? Well, thank you very much to you, Stan. I, I really want to join with the uh, previous speakers in thanking the GITOC, Mission of uh, Mexico, as well as the World Society of Ectomology for organizing this important side event. I'm speaking to you from Geneva, um, having just returned from Vienna recently. Um, and let me um, first and foremost start by congratulating uh, Dr. Collins on this uh, launch of his new book here in this, uh, in this event. Um, this, the launch of um, this book actually is uh, very, very crucial because in some ways for Singapore, it coincides with the 50th anniversary of the formation of our primary drug enforcement agency in Singapore, the Central Narcotics Bureau, just by coincidence. And, and interestingly, as the book 
touched on Singapore's history uh, as a British colony and how open smoking had plagued uh, uh, the colonial territories, you know, during our colonial past. Um, uh, and this is a subject of uh, interest to me on a personal level, having written on this, um, uh, you know, my own work of history. But I would say that let me now share a little bit more on Singapore's fight for drug-free Singapore since our independence. Um, and let me also say before I, I begin that um, Dr. John Collins has really, uh, going through his book, has really produced a very bravura tour de horizon of the whole history of drug diplomacy, multilateral drug diplomacy, with some fascinating um, uh, detailed discussions um, between delegates, among delegates. And, and I, I want to just start before I talk about Singapore's history by mentioning uh, a line that really struck out at me when I read his book, where uh, he quotes um, the UK mission uh, in the 50s in the CND. And we heard my colleague from uh, the UK talk a little bit about um, their approach and their participation. But there's a very fascinating um, intervention by the UK. And this is on page 175 of uh, Dr. Collins' book, where he um, quotes the UK delegate as warning against the CND becoming, quote, heavily weighted with an unscrupulous commercial bloc supported by doctrinaire elements, close quote. And I hope that we never allow the CND to become um, uh, featured or characterized as such, particularly when we're thinking and talking about the issue of cannabis. Now, Singapore is a major transshipment and transport hub in Southeast Asia and is susceptible to being used by drug syndicates as a transit and import market for traffic drugs. When we wanted to deal with a sudden surge historically of uh, uh, cannabis addicts, as well as uh, methacolone in the late 60s and early 70s after we became independent, we set up the, a dedicated uh, agency, which I mentioned earlier, the Central Narcotics Bureau, CND, to lead the fight against drug abuse and trafficking in, in Singapore in 1971. Um, our government also decided that we needed a new, strong anti-drug law. And the idea behind this was we needed more bite to deal with the worsening drug situation more effectively. And Dr. Chuck Collins mentions some of the context in the Golden Triangle in our region as well, some of the discussions around that. Uh, legislatively, we enacted in 1973 the Misuse of Drugs Act, MBA. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole national legislative history. I'm sure you, you can all uh, Google it if you want. But what's very important is that Singapore acceded, acceded to, the, to the 61 Convention in 1973. And sub subsequently, we also uh, acceded to the other conventions, um, uh, the Convention on Psychotropic Substances in 71, as well as um, the 1988 Convention. The fundamental principle um, underlying our approach against drugs is to prevent harm to our people and society. And again, uh, I stress prevent harm, not reduce, but prevent harm. This is much more effective than letting the drug problem go and fester uh, and only trying, as I mentioned, to just reduce the harm after it's happened. So, we don't, want to, we, we don't want to pick up the egg after it's dropped. We want to make sure the egg isn't dropped. So we adopted a holistic and evidence-informed approach to our drug policies with three key pillars, preventive drug education, strict laws and robust enforcement, and evidence-informed rehabilitation. Again, evidence-informed rehabilitation. There's a science to it. And we have this comprehensive suite of preventive education and rehabilitative interventions. And we make sure they're guided, they're con continuously updated and guided by international best practices and research on the latest developments and trends on drug abuse. Again, it's, it's scientific. And um, I'm actually the co-chair along with the EU, my EU colleague for the uh, UN Office of Drug and Controls Research and Analysis Branch. So this is something we take very seriously in terms of uh, best practices, science and, um, you know, uh, research the latest developments and trends. So far, and hopefully in the future, this approach has been successful in keeping Singapore's drug situation under control. Today, from a drugs perspective, uh, we're a safe country. We don't have no-go zones for the police, drug havens, needle parks that we have to warn our children about. Um, the number of abusers arrested 
um, has halved from over 6,000 in the 1990s in Singapore to around 3,000 today. Uh, the recidivism rate for abusers um, released from our drug rehabilitation centers has declined sharply from um, just under 70% in 1996 to under 25% um, for, for 2019. Now, what um, John Collins has done in this wonderful book um, is actually provide us a lot of useful perspective. My, my prime minister um, once mentioned, he said, the lessons of history need to be reinforced because if we don't remember them, we won't learn the hard won lessons and we'll fail to value what we've painstakingly built. And I think my British colleague and, um, and John have both mentioned this perspective of history. So we need, we need to look back to understand what's worked well for us, including in terms of whole regulatory multilateral um, development of drug control and continue to refine that approach. At a national level, Singapore regularly reviews our criminal justice system to ensure it remains relevant, progressive, and effective to safeguard our um, security and safety. Now, we are completely and um, devotedly committed to effective implementation of the conventions we've signed on to. Um, they have brought countries with different domestic drug approaches and interests into a framework for collective action. That's key. And this is based on what we believe is a shared and common understanding of the world drug problem and its implications. So the three international drug control conventions that constitute the cornerstone of the world drug control system is a, a massively useful framework. It's an excellent framework for us and remains extremely relevant in the global fight against drugs and something we have to try and preserve uh, and not undercut or chip away at. So finally, just to end by, by saying that our approach uh, may not be for everyone, but it's worked well for our context. It's helped keep the drug situation under control. We understand and we respect the fact that each country has, you know, in many ways, its own unique circumstances and may require a slightly different approach, uh, which the conventions provide for. So we look forward to engaging, continuing our engagement globally on an evidence-based approach, an evidence-based approach towards international drug policy making. And again, I want to just say that the thing that we must avoid is becoming doctrinaire extremists um, with, uh, with, with commercial aims in mind. Uh, I think the most important thing is protecting our societies. And um, once again, I'm happy to be here and I wholeheartedly commend this excellent survey of the foundation of the drug control system, as well as the very complex dynamics that shaped its creation. Thank you very much, Tuesday, and dear colleagues. Thank you so much, Ambas Ambassador Batia, for those very insightful and very well thought through remarks. We're grateful to have the insights of Singapore in this discussion. Our final panelist today is Ambassador Luis Javier Campunazano Pina, permanent representative of Mexico to the United Nations in Vienna. In his career, Mr. Campuzano has served in various capacities, among them advisor to the Under Secretary General for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Director General for the United Nations with postings in Norway and in Kenya. Ambassador, we really are delighted to have you with us today in closing out this panel. Obviously, Mexico has a number of different experiences with the history of drug policy and has been very much part of leading evolutions in drug policy in recent years. What for you, and we, in your remarks, does the history of the UN drug control mean for Mexico and how do you see things moving forward? Thank you very much. I will start by expressing our deepest appreciation uh, for having involved us uh, and myself to be part of this important and very urgent conversation. My congratulations to the organizers, to GTALK and to Dr. Collins for his presentation and for launching his book, which cer certainly is or should be a must read for anyone engaged in the CND. Regarding the history of the war on drugs, we should start by recognizing that there is a prevailing inclination, albeit a misguided one, to set the beginning of the history in either the adoption of the UN Convention in 1961 or the famous speech by Richard Nixon launching the war on drugs. And as iconic uh, as those two historical moments might be, I, I call them misguided because the approach embodied in, in that concept certainly predates them. 
I will not dare to repeat the same approach or trying to identify a specific date or momentum, such as the opium wars of the 19th century or the adoption of the conventions in the, 19th, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Suffice to say that the way before 1961, Mexico considered narcotic drugs as a venom and the Mexican army has already been engaged in confronting with drug cartels. Moreover, let me share with you the jewel that is Samantha, a, a colleague from my, my team, recently on up. In resolution two, illicit traffic adopted by the CND in 1947 states that the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, having taken note during its examination of the international illicit traffic of reports that there is an enormous clandestine production of opium in Mexico. And considering that the escape of contraband opium from Mexico into the illicit traffic is a source of danger to other countries, request the Economic and Social Council to recommend that the government of Mexico take appropriate measures in fulfillment of its international obligations on the narcotic conventions to suppress the illicit cultivation of opium. And here we have it already in 1947, when CND was two year old baby, we were already seeing drug trafficking pretty much as a confrontation among states and not as a challenge posed by drug traffickers to states as indicated by phrases such as a source of danger to other countries, where the only solution seemed to be a war of annihilation as embodied by the term to suppress. Throughout all those years, and that is an assertion that cannot be challenged, Mexico was not just only a pupil on the, uh, the school uh, of thought, but rather a very distinguished one. There were little states as engaged in the war of drugs as we were. So what happened then? How come did Mexico went from being seated in the front row with a star on its forehead to hang out with the hippie states, even to the point of being called just a couple of years ago, a narco liberal state by one of our colleagues in this building. Uh, uh, please don't even ask me what that ridiculous term is supposed to mean. Again, I will not dare to uh, set a specific date or momentum on when my country started, not only realize, but more importantly, to accept that the current approach is simply not working. I would ask to my distinguished colleague, a anarcho liberal state is one who questions that the current war on drugs is killing more people out of the violence that it generates than the, the people dying from the consumption of the drugs that it was unsuccessfully trying to suppress. And that is particularly true for marijuana. I would also like to ask to that person or to any of, uh, of you, if a state is a narco liberal state when it's fostering its effort to target the three main elements which empowers drug traffickers. In example, easy access to firearms, particularly high power weaponry, access to the illicit proceeds and corruption and impunity instead of continue focusing in the poor peasants involved either by coercion or for structural causes such as poverty to engage in the illicit production of drugs or the users who need to be addressed from a health perspective and not a criminal one. I will finish by answering the initial question of what to expect from Mexico in the future. Basically, that we will continue with our efforts to make our more efficient our responses to the challenges posed by drugs responses, which will be have, and the aim at its core, the well-being and the dignity of the persons. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for those remarks. Um, it's always interesting to hear, of course, the different perspectives of states and individuals experience with this process, and to know that this is a part of a shared dialogue as we move forward. Regrettably, with always the brevity of um, side events at the CND and other conventions, there's limited time for Q&A. So I'm afraid I am going to have to close the panel now. John has been answering in writing some of the questions that have come in during the, the meeting. And we would very much welcome if you wish to write in questions to him after the event. Anyone who's been here today, you're most welcome to do so. I'm sure he'd be very happy to answer them. 
And this meeting in and of itself will be posted on our YouTube channel at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and shared on our website, should you wish to go back and capture some of these remarks. So we do invite you, of course, at any time to pass by our website at www.globalinitiative.net. I think to say just as in conclusion, um, really how very interesting and positive it is that we can have these frank conversations in the framework of the multilateral system. As John's book showed, the history of UN drug control has been a very long and complex process with multiple turns and perspectives guiding and shaping it. Um, it's never easily distilled into a single framework or a, a short summary, but does require the nuance and deep accounts of various interstate processes and the national interests which have driven it. I think as we look forward into an increasingly fragmented and fractured world where the challenges to the multilateral system are great. We really have to do value forums like this, also which can be guided and, and hear the inputs of civil society. Certainly the remarks both of the ambassador of Singapore and the ambassador of Mexico showed how many different perspectives and people's lives are hinged on an effective response to the problem of narcotic drugs. So we continue, and I'm sure with my colleagues at the World Center of Victimology, to embrace and encourage this broad church approach to hear multiple voices in different places. And we thank you all for joining us and being part of this conversation today. I will close and wish you all well and positive deliberations for the rest of the CND. Thank you very much.